Okay, I think we'll kick things off. Got about 150 people in the room and might uh, go up as we go through. So, uh, very quick one to, to, to start. So, um, thank you for joining today. Uh, my name is Jack Coldrick. I am a member of the solutions engineering team at HubSpot. My pronouns are he and him. And for anyone out there with uh, any visual impairments, I am a white male wearing a navy top and I have black hair. And um, today, what I'm hoping to walk through actually is not necessarily a slide, uh, a slide deck, but rather an actual workshop or a tutorial. Um, I wanted to run through uh, what we call custom coded automation, which is a feature of our operations hub. Um, for any of you who don't know out there, uh, operations hub is effectively a product that we offer that is really targeted for uh, operations teams, as the name would suggest, RevOps teams and the like. And it gives them the, the tools to basically connect various apps to HubSpot, clean and curate that data, and also automate business processes. And there's a lot there. What we're going to be focusing on today is the automation component, uh, the custom coded workflow actions. And we're specifically going to be um, using an example with one of our uh, partners, Clearbit. Uh, which is a, a really, really powerful uh, B2B enrichment uh, uh, tool marketing platform. Uh, we'll be looking at it uh, in a couple of minutes, but uh, we're going to be using their APIs to actually enrich some of the data in the CRM um, and really just help you to understand the mechanics of how all, how, of how all of this works. Uh, so, you know, I love talking about Operations Hub and I love talking about coded automation, but I think unless you can really see it in action, um, you know, it's quite difficult to grasp the concept of. So, so that's the plan. I'll be basically from scratch building out an example and I'll be encouraging you as well to uh, follow along. Um, my colleague Jan is also um, monitoring the, uh, the chat. Um, what I would say is just in the interest of time, we're gonna allow for questions. It'll, we'll probably address them at the end. We're, we're hoping for about 10, 15 minutes worth of questions. Um, and also, as I mentioned, these re this recording will be shared uh, and also, uh, if I press escape here, uh, just to show you, this entire deck will also be shared with you. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, uh, slides in this deck that basically just walks through all the steps we're going to be taking today with rel uh, 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 relative links out to the, the different assets and resources that you'll, you'll need. Um, but very quickly, before we dive in, I'm just going to give a, a, a whistle-stop overview of what we're going to be doing, and then we're going to work backwards. So... Today, we're going to be going to the developers.hubspot.com website, and we're going to be creating a developer account. Uh, that will give us access to a portal or account that you see here, uh, an interface where we can actually create test accounts to, to build out our, 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 our use case. Uh, we're going to be navigating to our friends Clearbits website, and we're going to be signing up for a free account there as well. What that will allow us to do is access our Clearbit dashboard, but more importantly, will allow us to access their APIs so we can get our API key and we can make a request to their enrichment API. And then from the HubSpot end, what we're gonna be doing is we'll add some test data into the portal. You can see here uh, in anticipation of this workshop, I was obviously making sure this would all work. So I've been doing some practice rounds. You can see I've got some companies here in the CRM and you can see I'm pulling in some data from an external source. Um, we're gonna be creating some properties to hold that data. Uh, and you can kind of see it here. We've got our Marvel. I'm a big Marvel and Avengers fan. We've got some data there being pulled in from Clearbit. Uh, we've got HubSpot. Uh, we've got Amazon. Um, and uh, what's going to all facilitate this is a custom coded action in a workflow. So when a company is created, we're going to run some code. We're going to make a request to Clearbit. It's going to send us back some data, and we're going to store it in, a, um, uh, in some properties so that we can leverage it. Um, what I'd also say, too, is that all of the code today, and as I said, the slides will be shared, all of the code today is, is accessible. So we'll make sure you have access to the links. You're free to type along with me if you like, but don't worry if, you're, if you don't wanna follow along, you just wanna listen, or if you, you know, fall behind or whatever the case may be, uh, we've got you covered. All of the code is here today and the slides will accompany that when we send them out to you. Um, and before we dive in, maybe what I'll do is to, to keep me honest here, I'll maybe ask you guys, would anyone like to put a, uh, their 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 business website into the chat and I will create the company and we'll just see what's going to happen and then we'll start to build this out <laughs> so let's uh if someone wants to pop in um their business website I'll take it we'll drop it in here and we'll just see it in action and then we'll start building so loads and loads of stuff's uh dropping in there so I'm going to try and uh <laughs> see if I can actually try and grab one um 
All right, let's see here. We're gonna go with, uh, okay, I'll actually, I'm gonna take, whoop, I saw there uh, Trinity College, uh, which is a university here in Dublin. So let's take that one as an example. Uh, all right, so we're gonna click create a company. And what we're gonna do is paste in the Trinity College domain. And we're getting some information here. Um, or sorry, I'm guessing this is Trinity College in London in this instance. There's also a Trinity College in Dublin. Um, but let's just create that, that company. Now, what I'll also do is whilst we're waiting, we'll take some more of these. Uh, there's Whitehaven Capital. Maybe we'll throw that in here as well and create this company. I'm just going to add a few in the chat uh, at here, Creative. And let's take, uh, I think I saw one more that I like the look of. Uh, oops, so, so many, Foxter.io take that one too. All right. So got a few companies in there. Now, what's actually happening here is um, you'll see at the moment, we don't really have any data because the workflow in the background is running. It takes a couple of seconds for all of this to happen. But what we can actually do is if we refresh this screen, we should see uh, that there's data starting to be captured for the companies that we would have just created. So you can see Trinity College here. We're pulling in some of the, the different domains that they own, the technology that they're running, uh, the industry that they fall into. It here, Creative, we can see they're using Wistia and Cloudflare and GoDaddy for hosting, I presume. Um, so we're pulling in all of this data. And this information is coming to us. And as I refresh here, Foxter's uh, we're pulling in some information regarding their tech stack, internet and software. Uh, all this data is coming from a third party source. Now, in this example, data enrichment is, is really what we're going to be focusing on. But the reality is um, you're going to be able to apply what you learned today for a variety of different use cases. It doesn't have to be coming from uh, a data enrichment platform, which, by the way, Clearbit is not only data enrichment, there's a lot more and is an incredibly powerful tool, uh, but the tools you learn today, you can actually take and expand upon. Um, I really just wanted to use this as an example because it, I think it's very relevant to all of us here. It's very tangible and, and easy to understand and follow along. And the data here as well, if you think about it, could be used for a variety of different things. You might have account-based marketing where you want to go after you know, companies in different industries with different technologies. Um, you might be selling it to different uh, regions. You, you know, it would help to understand maybe all of the websites that a company owns to get an, a grasp of subsidiaries and their overall businesses. Uh, there's tons and tons of use cases. So we've seen it in action. Let's actually start to build it. So what we're going to do here is, and I'll encourage you all to do this, is navigate to developers.hubspot.com and click on the, the big orange button to create a developer account. Now, there's a few... Uh, a few steps that you have to go through in terms of just giving, I think, your job title and your email, etc. Uh, but you end up with, it's entirely free to do, you end up with an environment like this. And whilst people are uh, doing that, I might just describe the benefits to creating a, a developer account. So developer accounts really give um, you the, uh, uh, the, the, the environment to uh, create and register applications. So for example, you might want to build an app that could be used in a multitude of different HubSpot portals. Uh, so you can actually build and manage your app and the scopes there. Uh, that's not relevant to us today. Um, it allows us to, if we click on the testing tab, create up to 10 test accounts. Um, I, you'll see here I have one already created. These test accounts last for a period of 90 days. Uh, they can be renewed manually at any stage. Uh, and they really give you access to uh, the, the, the enterprise suite really of HubSpot, the developer edition. Uh, so there is certain limitations, as you can imagine, around email sending and uh, that type of thing. But uh, for all intents and purposes, it really gives you a, a, a nice way to try and test the functionality that we offer and also the APIs that we offer. Um, a couple of other things as well, you know, if you're, if you're maybe, uh, if you're an app partner and you're listing your app on our marketplace, you can manage those listings from within here. We link off to our documentation and we link off to the developer form as well. Uh, but the primary thing that we're focused on today is this testing tab. So if everyone has gone through the, the sign up process and they have a, a screen that looks something like this, uh, simply just create, uh, click on the testing tab, click on create app test account. And I'm just going to call mine, um, uh, clear bit workshop. Okay, and I'm gonna click create. And there we go, we got that ready to go. What I can actually do then is I can open up that, that account and you'll see here I'm now in a, kind of a developer version of a HubSpot portal. Um, so I've got all of my different tools up here in the navigation. See here, it's a developer test account. And I think there'll also be a little bit of dummy data in there. So we might have uh, two contacts, Brian Halligan, Maria Johnson and some company data. but 
you have the ability now to navigate through this tool. The other thing that we're going to do now that we have this set up is we are going to navigate over to Clearbit. So you can get there by going to clearbit.com. I uh, will place the link in the chat as well. And you'll be able to, uh, I actually have a, an account already, but there should be a sign up option here on the top right. Clicking that, to my knowledge, will bring you down towards the bottom of the page and you can actually create a free account here. And if you just go through that process, what you will end up with is a dashboard that looks like this. And as mentioned previously, Clearbit is incredibly powerful. Um, it, data enrichment is just a portion of what this tool does. Um, it allows you to create audiences to enrich your marketing efforts across you know, the different social and uh, paid channels that you might be advertising on. Uh, and one of the really, really cool things that it does is it actually will take data from your CRM, but it will also use its own database. So you basically 10Xs your, your, your reach. Um, there's a lot there under the hood. Um, I know there's a few people from Clearbit in the audience today. Um, maybe if questions are coming in, they might take them, but uh, do check it out if you'd like in more detail. What we're really gonna be focusing on is a small component of it, uh, which is the, the enrichment piece in the API. So uh, if you've signed up for Clearbit, you'll have a dashboard like this. And the um, most important thing is then to uh, click on this API option here on the left. Now, just to show you what to expect here, it will bring you into a screen like this. Uh, we'll be coming back to this in a moment, but this is my API key. You all know that now, which is not good. Obviously you should keep your API keys secret. Obviously this is a, a workshop, so <laughs> it's, it's not, it doesn't really have any concerns to me that you'll, you'll see this, uh, but make sure that you, you, you keep your API secret. You're not sharing it with people because this is effectively like having a key to you know someone's house. If you have an API key, you can get in and access data. Um, we'll be using that a little bit later on to authenticate our request. Um, so we have our, our test account set up. We should hopefully have our Clearbit uh, account test uh, uh, set up also. What I'm also gonna do is just jump into the documentation for a second, um, because this is important to note. Um, uh, regardless of whether you're using Operations Hub or custom code or building your own projects, it's always good to familiarize yourself with the, the technical documentation. Um, so Clearbit has a very extensive uh, uh, API and uh, lots and lots of endpoints we can hit to pull a variety of different pieces of information out. Uh, we are going to be looking today at their enrichment API, uh, which you can see here on the left-hand side. And really, specifically under the enrichment API, I'm particularly interested about the, the company lookup or the company API. The way this works is it will take a domain name and return some data. Uh, and when I say some data, it's actually a considerably lengthy amount of data. So you can actually see here in the documentation uh, they give us an example of what we can expect back it's in JSON format, which is just a data format typically used to pass data between uh, services on the web. Um, we have all of this data that we can leverage. Uh, and if you'd like a description, obviously on the left here, they break down what each uh, attribute is actually representing. Now, you can see there's a ton and ton of data here. Um, you're free obviously to, to, to build on this workshop and pull whatever you'd like out if you, if you want to extend on this. but I'm going to be focusing on a small uh, portion of this. I'm going to basically be taking the legal name, um, which could be relevant because you may have people putting in company names, but not specifying the legal name potentially. Uh, I'm going to be using the domain aliases here as well. That's relevant um, to understand other websites that they own. Look at Amazon, for example, they've got tons and tons of other businesses that uh, are operated by them. So just understanding, and that could help you identify ways to sell into that company. Um, uh, and I'm also going to be taking some information from the category here, which defines the industry that they're, they're residing in. Um, but as I mentioned, you're completely free to take whatever data you like. And even after this workshop, you're free to, uh, you know, and I'd encourage you to try and test some of the other endpoints to kind of, you know, get, get a flavor for what's possible. So at this point, we created our test account. That's where we're going to build everything. We have created our Clearbit account so that we can actually make requests to their service and pull data out. What we're going to do now is we're actually going to um, get our test account ready to go. So what I'd encourage you to do is, and actually I'm not going to use this one, I'm going to use my brand new one with no data in it. What I'd encourage you to do is maybe jump into companies and add a company. Uh, so I'm just going to add a company here and I'm going to put in, uh, mentioned I was a Marvel fan, so I'll just put in Marvel. 
and maybe just add another one. Um, let's say hubspot.com. And I'm going to also add in clearbit.com. All right. Uh, and I am also a rugby fan. Really looking forward to the Six Nations. So I'm going to put in I or F U. I think it's .ie. So there we go. Pop that in too. So, that, so we've got a couple of uh, companies here in the uh, CRM. We'll be using this to test. Um, so that's all we need to do at this point. The other important thing we need to do is we need to create some properties. So if we jump back to the Clearbit documentation, you'll see that there's a ton of data that it will supply us with. Now HubSpot gives you some default properties, but in reality, you'd likely need to create your own properties to hold this data. So what we can actually do here at this point is from my, the, the portal, we're gonna click on the little gear icon on the top right-hand side and open a link in a new tab. From within here, we're in the settings of the account. We can actually begin to create and manage the properties amongst other things within the HubSpot system. Now, uh, you'll notice here, we're looking at contacts and I don't want to, we're not working with contacts in this instance, we're working with companies. So on the left-hand side, you'll see the ability to click on companies and it brings us into the companies management uh, screen. Uh, and I'm gonna manage my company properties. Now, from within here, uh, what I will do, uh, in fact, what I'll do before that is I'll click on groups. I'll click on create a group and I'll give it a name. I'll just call it clear bit data. Groups are just ways of organizing properties so they're easy to find. And then I'm gonna jump back to my properties and I'm gonna create some and add them to that group. So we're creating it for a company. We wanna add it to the clear bit data group. Let's create some properties. So I'm interested in the domain aliases. So I'm gonna type in domain aliases. Um, so what we should uh, uh, what we should have at this point is um, yeah nice and simple just a label domain aliases it's going to hold some data that is going to be a multi line text field because naturally it's going to send us back maybe it could be quite a lengthy list of, of aliases there uh, other websites that a company owns what I'm also going to do is create another uh, multi line text property uh, under the Clearbit data group and it's going to be for the tech that that this company uses. And uh, apologies, I'm, I'm clicking through quite quickly to say the recording will be shared and the, the slides will cover all of this in a lot more detail as well, just working towards the, the time that we have, uh, the multi-line text field type and tech. And I'm also going to create one final property. Uh, I'm going to create clear big data and I'm going to call it sub industry. Uh, one of the things I really like about Clearbit is that um, it, it, it has a couple of layers to how it categorizes companies. So um, uh, you can actually to jump back to the documentation, if you if you click on, uh, I think it's categories here, uh, you can actually see a complete list and there's sector, industry groups, industries, and sub-industries. So you can actually get very, very granular in terms of your, your, your segmentation and how you want to go after maybe target accounts and that type of thing. Um, so the sub-industry property is particularly interesting for me in this case anyway. Uh, so I am going to jump back into my account and add this sub-industry field and click next. And this time it's just going to be a single text field. Uh, now, in reality, you can see there's a whole host of different properties you types you can create. Um, just to be aware of that, it doesn't have to be text. You could have numeric data. And the reason, and also what I'd say is, whilst the single line text field can actually hold anything, um, it, you've got to think about how you want to use this data. Because uh, let's imagine you were to put a number in a text field. Well, then when you go to segment or when you go to automate processes and you want to use that data, the filters that you have available are slightly different. And what I mean by that is typically with numbers, you want to maybe look at, you know, is greater than or less than or equal to or between. Uh, with text, generally, you're looking at contains or is equals to or does not equal. So, so the filters are actually quite important to think about. That's more just a, a little best practice tip to consider. Or dates as well, if it did date is before, on, or after a certain time frame. Um, so we're going to use single line text and create that. So what you should actually have now, if we click on groups and click on clear bit data, is three properties, domain aliases, which is a multi-line text, sub-industry, which is a single line text, and tech, which is a multi-line text. And that really is the, 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 the foundations laid for us to begin building out a custom coded action. So what I'll do at this point now is uh, I am going to navigate up to automation and workflows, and I'm gonna open that in a new tab. 
our automation tool, by the way, for anyone who doesn't know, our workflows tool is, is, is a way for you to automate processes within HubSpot. In the marketing space, it can be used for lead nurturing. The sales space, it can be used for lead rotation. Um, it can also be used for notifications if maybe deals don't have activity or you, know, you need to uh, notify someone to maybe uh, reach out to a POC in relation to a, a, an opportunity that's on the table. On the services side, it can be used for ticket activity uh, or notifying your customers when tickets are opened or closed. Um, uh, but from an operations standpoint, what we can do, and we'll see in a moment, is we can actually also embed custom coded actions in here so we can actually create our own bespoke logic. So what we'll do is we're going to click on create a workflow. And it's going to bring us into an interface like this. We're going to choose start from scratch. We give you some templates to work from if you'd like. Uh, depending on the HubSpot plan you have, we'll dictate the types of records you can build workflows around. Um, all professional tiers by default will have contact company and deal-based workflows available. Uh, Service Hub will give you ticket-based workflows. Sales Enterprise will give you enterprise uh, uh, or quote-based workflows. Um, we're particularly interested in company-based here because we're listening for data at a company level. So we click company and we have some options. Um, another thing to point out, we're not looking at it today, but Operations Hub Professional will actually give you the ability to schedule uh, recurring workflows. So you actually might want to run a job that runs maybe daily at a specific date or time that will fetch data from another system or perform some sort of logic. It's worth noting that that's there. We're just going to be starting from blank. We'll give it a name and we're going to call it data enrich, uh, whoops, enrichment uh, clear bit and we'll click next. And what we're going to be presented with now is a blank slate to begin building all of this out. Uh, workflows typically, the most important thing to consider is the trigger for a workflow. So what must, must, what must happen in order for this workflow to execute? In this case, we simply wanted it to be just anytime a company is created, they'll enter into the workflow and the actions will run. So you can get quite advanced with, in terms of how you build these out. So we'll choose company, we'll choose create date, and we'll set that to is known. So anytime a company is created, they'll have a create date and they'll enter into the workflow, which you can see here, we can actually use and or logic to get a little bit more uh, refined in terms of the, the companies that we're allowing in. You might create um, separate workflows for companies in different industries, or uh, you might create separate workflows for companies that are uh, target accounts or have uh, key stakeholders involved, that type of thing. So a lot of ways you can, you can, you can uh, uh, manipulate this. we we'll click save. Uh, another important point is if you'd like, there's a re-enrollment tab. We don't need it today, but um, by default, a, a record will only go through a workflow once, but if you want the logic in this workflow to execute again, if it meets the criteria, you need to enable re-enrollment. Um, just worth noting, depending on what you're trying to do here, we're leaving it off in this case today. And we click trigger and we click save. So that's our enrollment criteria. The next thing is we'll click plus and you'll see we're presented with a ton of actions here on the right-hand side. Um, now, I'm not gonna go through all of them, um, but there's a, a ton of, of different actions to help you with both your external and internal processes. Um, Operations Hub specifically will give you access to the ability to trigger webhooks. So if we click on that, we could actually send data out to an endpoint of your choosing and you could consume that data and then do something with it within your application. Um, what it will also allow you to do is uh, leverage or format some data. So for example, uh, any of the data in the system, uh, let's just choose uh, I don't know, close date, maybe the, the time a, comp a customer, a company became a customer. Uh, we could maybe manipulate, manipulate that data with some preset formulas. So maybe if it's a date, I'd want to add a specific amount of time. And maybe I want to add, I don't know, uh, three weeks to that close date and that's, or, or, or four weeks or whatever. And that's our renewal date or something like that. Um, so there's this, this formatting data option, which will give you access to a, a, a range of different formula. Um, but today what we're focusing on and the most important is the custom coded action. So if I click on it here, this is really where we can uh, get very, very creative and build out our own bespoke logic to interface with other systems, in this case, Clearbit. Um, now, I appreciate that there's a lot of information being thrown at you here, I'm conscious of that. Um, but uh, let's just break this down a little bit here on the right-hand side, what we're looking at. So these custom coded actions, uh, allow you to write JavaScript in a node runtime environment, which is basically just a fancy way of saying run JavaScript on the server side. Um, what we also have 
is the ability to run Python as well now with these custom coded uh, actions. Uh, admittedly, my Python is not great, so I'm not going to be showing you any Python today. I'm going to be sticking with JavaScript, but just know that that is an option. Um, so what we can do here is we have our framework. Uh, and you'll see there's a couple of things here. We have our secrets. So these secrets are the API keys or any kind of usernames or passwords that we want to reference in our code. We don't want to expose because we don't maybe necessarily want people to see that. Um, so this is just kind of security best practices. We'll be adding some secrets in a moment, specifically for the Clearbit API. Uh, properties to include in the code. This is, uh, in this case, we want to send the domain name of a company to Clearbit so that they can send us back data. So this allows us basically to choose a property in the CRM and then reference it in our code and do what we like with it effectively. Down here then you'll see, if I, I, I prefer the dark mode, we've got our, our, our code snippets, our, our, our code uh, window where we can actually input the code. You can go full screen if you'd like, and I'd recommend it, it's just easier to, 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 to look at, but this is where we're gonna actually write our, our, our logic. Uh, and then as we scroll further down, you'll actually see we have data output fields. Uh, this is really important. So basically, unlike a webhook, because this is a question I get asked is, what's the difference between this and a webhook? Um, a webhook will send data out, but you won't get anything back and you can't do anything with that data. Uh, custom code actions, on the other hand, not only is the logic hosted uh, on the cloud, we use AWS Lambda for that, uh, not only is the logic hosted, but when you make a request, the data that's returned, you can actually execute off the back of. So it gives you much more flexibility and power to, to build out systems and, and processes here. And naturally with that data that's returned, you'd like to, to, to do something with it. Uh, so typically with these data output fields, you can then pass that data into other properties in the CRM, or you might have other custom coded workflow actions further down the, 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 the process that could reference those values. So the data output field is uh, incredibly important to be conscious of uh, in terms of passing data back to the workflow so that it can be utilized. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to start building out this action. So the first thing I said was uh, we need to add a secret because we need to make requests to Clearbit and we need our API key to do that. So in order to do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to our Clearbit um, dashboard, click on the API button, and we're gonna take our API key. So there we go. We're just gonna take that. Then I'm gonna jump back over to uh, the workflow and I'm gonna choose a secret. Now I don't have any secrets yet, so I'm gonna add a secret. I'm gonna paste in my secret value. Again, keep that secret. I'll be revoking this after this workshop, <laughs> uh, but you don't wanna share that with anyone. Um, and what we also need to do is we need to give our secret a name. This could be anything, but this is what we'll reference it as in our code. And we save it. And you'll see here now this API key is uh, listed there as an option for us to leverage. And we can add multiple secrets. I could, for argument's sake, if I want, also add the HubSpot API key. If I wanted to do that, I would jump into settings, integrations, API key. I would generate or create a key. Uh, and I'll be copying a key and jumping back. And I'll just be adding another secret. So I'll add another secret and I'll say, this is the HubSpot API key and I'll paste the value in. So now I have two secrets I can use in my code. Uh, so this can be useful if you're talking to multiple different systems. The next thing we need to do is we need to also pass in the company domain because we need to reference that in our code. Now you could, if you wanted, use the HubSpot API to fetch that or pull it, uh, but that wouldn't be an unnecessary API request that you're making. So this is just a way of cutting down on that. So we'll choose our company domain name. You'll see we can give it a name. We'll just keep a default domain, but we can give it a, a value that we would reference it as. And once that's done then, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually start building out our code. So I'm gonna set this to full screen here. And I, I, I'm not sure if this is hard to see. I'll do my best to zoom in. I think it's about as good as I can get it. Um, but we're gonna start writing some code here to, to build this. Now you'll see that I've got a bit of a template here. We'll give you a template by default to get you up and running. Um, I might just break this down to give you an overview. So. Towards the top, what we're doing is we're importing any libraries we want to use. Uh, I will say that we don't support, um, th there's a fixed set of libraries that we support uh, currently. Uh, you can't include any library you'd like, though I believe we are working on that functionality. Uh, so you might be including the, you know, the request library to make a HTTP request. You might be using, uh, uh, referencing the MySQL library to talk to a database. There's different libraries you can employ uh, from within here to, to, to 
you know, create a code snippet. Um, we also have within here uh, a function exports.main. And this is, this is basically anything in here is what's going to run when our custom code action is reached in the workflow. Uh, now this, this uh, uh, function takes two arguments, event and callback. Event contains information relating to the, the company that is in this workflow. So I could actually uh, use the event object, uh, object to actually get uh, the company ID or, or that type of thing um, to reference in my code. The callback is very important because that allows us to pass data back to the workflow and then our data outputs can be leveraged to pass it into other properties. Um, as we go down to, we have the HubSpot API client, so we can use our API key. You'll see that it's actually referencing the secret. So you can't see my API key, but the code is, is pulling that in. Um, and really from this point on, it's just some logic. You'll, you'll see as well in this case, if we wanted to pull in an email address, we can reference those input fields that we, we specified earlier on. So we can use that data. We have this callback object as well. So we can um, callback functions so that we can pass data back to the workflow. Uh, and we just have a, a, a template here so that you can reference and leverage it. To be quite honest with you, uh, none of this is, is, is important today. Uh, we're gonna be basically starting from scratch. Um, I think Jan should have shared the code snippet in the, the, the chat. If you'd like, you can copy and paste it in. Um, depending on time, I, I may also do that, just consider uh, a conscious time, but let me uh, remove everything. So we have nothing there. And let's actually paste that, that code snippet in. And I'll talk you through exactly what this is doing and make sure that everyone is happy um, and understands what we're, we're doing today. So there we go. So this is my code snippet today. Now, what we can see this time here is instead of the HubSpot API client, I'm actually including the request library. Uh, we also support Axios, which is another library to make HTTP requests. If I'm not mistaken, it's a little bit more lightweight. Um, and in fact, um, I might, uh, I'll stick with the request this time. I, I, I do prefer using Axios actually, but uh, uh, in, we'll stick with a request today. Um, I think in the code snippets we, we've shared, there is an Axios example. So you'll be able to use that if you'd like. Um, but what we have here is, let's, let's just go through it. So we, we're importing our request library so we can leverage it. We have our function that contains all of the code that we want to run. As we navigate down, you'll see that we're storing the company domain in a variable so that we can send it to Clearbit. We're also creating some uh, variables so that we can store data that Clearbit sends us back so that we can pass it to the callback object so that we can copy it into other properties in our workflow. This point, from this point on then, we're configuring our request. So we're using that request library to make a request to the Clearbit API. So here, for example, what we're doing is we're saying, well, it's a get request. There's different types of requests depending on what you're trying to do. RESTful APIs are built around the HTTP protocol. You've got gets, you've got puts, you've got posts, you've got deletes. Really what these are, the types of actions you're performing. So deletes would be to remove data generally. Gets is to retrieve data. Uh, puts and posts are generally to update or create data. Um, so the method is very, very important. Uh, we're also, we have our, our URL. Uh, this is the endpoint that we've taken from the Clearbit doc API documentation that we want to, to reference or hit. Uh, and you'll also notice that they're expecting us to pass through the company domain. So that's what I'm including here, the company domain. So you'll see here on line number six, this is where I got a reference to it. And on line number 12, I'm including it in my code so that it's going to go through on that request. Um, we need to also authenticate uh, so Clearbit knows that we have permission to use their APIs. So this headers uh, uh, array or our object here is effectively allowing us to pass through our API key. And again, you'll see that I'm referencing my secret here, process.env, and then the name of whatever the secret was. At this point now, our configuration is set. We're ready to actually make that request. So you can see here what I'm doing really is I'm just making a request to the Clearbit API and it's returning some data and that will be returned in the body. And you'll see that these variables on line 22 down to line 25 um, uh, are, 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 are being passed values. So for example, Clearbit's gonna send me back some domain aliases. So I'm passing that into this domain alias property. It's also gonna pass me some technology. So I'm doing the same. Uh, interesting to note that it will actually pass you through uh, uh, effectively a, a, an array of data. And what I wanna do is break that down. So I'm basically, 
breaking that array down and I'm, I'm using a comma to separate out the values. That's what this join function is. It's basically creating a string of comma separated values so I can store it in a property. Um, the reason I preferred using Axios is because it re really removes the need to do any of that. Axios uh, automatically stringifies the data. Um, um, it's a little bit more efficient. Um, and as I say, the, the example code has that there if you want to reference it. Sub industry and the legal name. So it's all, all there ready to go. And then what I'm doing here is I'm just passing it back to the callback object. So my output fields, I've got my domain aliases, my tech, my sub industry, and my legal name. So that's effectively what the code is doing. The important thing as well is we need to add, we need to reference these output fields here in our uh, add to output properties here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say the data type and apologies, I might zoom out for a sec because it's acting up on me. Uh, I'm gonna choose string and I'm gonna type in um, domain aliases. Oops, aliases. Uh, I'm gonna add another one and it's also a string. So there's different types of data you can pass back to a workflow, depending on the property you're copying it to. You, you, know, you might wanna be copying a date into a date field or Boolean into a Boolean, a yes, no value. We're just operating with strings here. Uh, I'm also gonna type in uh, tech. Uh, we also have, I believe it's a sub industry. So pop that in there, sub industry. I'm literally just referencing the names of the output fields here that you can see there. And finally, we also have the uh, legal name. Okay. And we're done. Now, what I'd recommend we do now is we save it. So that code isn't gonna go anywhere. Uh, and what I'm gonna make sure is that this actually all works. So I should close and open it back up there open up the full screen, go back into the dark mode. And there we go, we have all of our code ready to go. So we wanna make sure this works. So you'll see down here, we have the ability to actually test an action. So in this case, we wanna enroll one of the companies that we would have just created in our CRM. So I might choose uh, Marvel as an example, and I'll click test. Now it's worth noting that whilst, if there's other workflow actions, they won't execute, but the code will execute. So this is just saying, you know, be conscious that this will make changes though it is a test, so it might be worthwhile using a test company. We click on test and we should hopefully see, yeah, it's a success. And you'll see that we're getting back data in those output fields. So at this point now, I'm satisfied that my code is doing what I want it to do. It's making that request, Clearbit's sending us some data back and I'm passing it successfully to the, um, the callback object and into the workflow. Now I can begin to use this data. So what I would do is I'd click save. And at this point now, I'm gonna add a couple of other actions. I'm going to add the, if I scroll down, the copy property value action. And you'll see here what we're going to be allowed to do is we can choose. Um, we could choose, you know, we might want to copy a company property to a to a, a custom property or another company property. But we're actually going to use the custom code outputs here. So I can actually choose all of these. I'll choose tech and I'll copy that into the tech custom property I created. Uh, for easy use, you can actually clone this and I'll just place it here and save. And what I'll do here is I'll take the sub industry and I'll copy it into the sub industry field. And you get the idea. We're basically going to do this for each of the properties that we actually want to copy into the, to the custom properties that we, we created earlier on. So we have legal name. We maybe want to update uh, the company's name in this case. So that's a default property, not a custom property here. And finally, uh, let's just go back and copy a value we'll choose uh, custom code. I think we have domain aliases and we'll copy that into domain aliases. So we've basically built out uh, a code action that will query Clearbit, send data back, copy it into the respective properties we'd like, and we can run this code. Now, another thing you could do at this point as well, is you could add if then logic. So for example, I could actually uh, now reference these properties that are holding values further down the workflow. So I could, I could maybe say, I wanna go after companies in specific industries. So maybe I've got, um, you know, maybe the sub industry uh, contains any of, I don't know, maybe internet and software. And maybe we'll call that technology. Uh, we'll clone that as well. And maybe we'll create another one and we'll call it consumer goods for argument's sake. And we'll pop in the sub industry or the industry might have retail, leisure, uh, electronics and we'll click apply. Um, and then maybe none of this is met, so we have a fallback, another pathway. What we can then do is we can actually branch out using this data. And what's more is 
uh, we may have more advanced logic we want to execute if a company does fall into one of these categories. So what I'd be free to do at this point is I could actually add another custom coded action down here and I'm free to write whatever I like in there, but I can also, this time you'll see, use some of the outputs from the other custom coded action and this custom coded action. So you can kind of see how we can reference values further down the chain. Um, you know, so for argument's sake, maybe there's a company created in an industry you don't do business with and you want to automatically delete it. Well, then you could use the HubSpot APIs to delete that company or flag it as such or something like that. Uh, so just wanted to demonstrate how you can reference those values. But all of this now is effectively ready to go. What I can do is I can really click here, review, publish, and turn on. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to enroll all of the companies that I have in the CRM. Uh, so there's four here that we created at the start. So I'm going to turn it on and I'm going to let it do its thing. If I jump back to companies here, the, the four that I created, I'm just going to edit the columns and remove everything. And I'm just going to add in the, the clear bit information that we wanted to focus on. So if I can find that, uh, let's see here. Uh, ah, I know it's not showing. I need to refresh the page. Apologies. Uh, and then I'll edit the view, remove everything, and I'll just type in, I think it should be towards the bottom, clear bit data aliases. There we go. And apply. And now you'll actually see we've got all of this data that this, so this workflow, as I was doing that, was doing its thing, was making those requests. Those companies were going through it, and the data is being updated accordingly. We've got the domains. So the Irish Rugby or IRFU have several domains that they operate. It's in the sports, sporting goods and you know sports industry. All of the tech that they use, the same with uh, Clearbit here, um, HubSpot, Marvel, it's all there. And as I add more companies, that, 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 that logic will execute. That's all been made possible by custom-coded workflow actions. Um, and really to, 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 to recap, I know we've covered an absolute ton of stuff in this session. Um, there, there's so much that you can do. So we, we created our test account, our developer account rather. From there, we can create test accounts. We can create up to 10 of those. They last 90 days. You can renew them manually. You can delete them and spin up new ones. That gives us basically a, a clean slate in which we can build, try and test HubSpot tools and or APIs. Uh, we, we went to Clearbit, we set up an account there, uh, we, we, we got our API key, we referenced their documentation, we got a good command of what we were trying to do. We jumped back to our test account, we created some custom properties to hold that data, we built out our workflow, and we bego began to manage our custom coded actions. Um, and really the output is a, an end-to-end -end solution that is, is, is querying another system. And we're using Clearbit, which again, brilliant platform, and I would highly recommend checking out in more detail. But this, in theory, could be any system. This could be your own internal system that maybe houses customer data. So maybe if a contact's created, you want to verify it or you know, pull data in from, from another source. So it's really the, the mechanisms of all of this and the in, inner workings that I wanted to showcase today. Um, and as I mentioned, I didn't just want to stick to slides because I just, I'm not a big advocate of that. I think you need to see it in action and build it from scratch. Um, and as mentioned, all of this will be shared with you, full transparency. The slides are very comprehensive. It runs through everything step by step by step. Um, towards the end as well, it links off to useful resources. Um, some of those useful resources, I'd highly recommend checking out the Operations Hub community. Um, if you wanna like collaborate with peers, share knowledge, learn from other Operations Hub and custom code users. Uh, we've got our custom code use case library with tons of pre-packed code snippets that can give you some inspiration. Um, tons and tons of uh, uh, documentation there, links to Clearbit and their HubSpot integration. So lots and lots to consider there. Um, uh, and also what I'd, what I'd also love if you, if you wouldn't mind doing is connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'd love to touch base there and answer any questions you have and follow up this session. I'm always sharing tips, tricks, and all sorts of tutorials on LinkedIn. So please do feel free. We'll be sharing that with you. Um, and we're also going to be running some other sessions. So this is our enrichment session. But for every week in February, next week, we're going to be doing email validation. The week after, building a referral program. And the week after that, actually querying an external database. Uh, so there's more to come, and they'll adopt a similar format. So what I'll do now, you'll be happy to know, is I'll stop talking. <laughs> I do appreciate it through loads of information at you, and I'm apolog I apologize just working within the time constraints. Um, but I would pause and open it up for questions and would love to gain your thoughts and uh, hear your thoughts and insights on today's session. Um, so let's see, uh, I'm gonna navigate back over. 
Yeah, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, yes, I can. Should I, I field you the questions? Uh, if, if you don't mind, because I, <laughs> I've got so many tabs yeah, no, open. No problem. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, no and problem. thank you. For, I, I see people are, uh, I'm glad people enjoyed it. Um, hope it was helpful. So thank you for the, the kind words. <laughs> I hope so too. You did, you did very great, uh, Jack. Um, but let's get over to uh, the first question. Um, it was one by Lydia. If I have a sales hub professional um, license, do I have access to any of these capabilities or is, it, or is this unique to Operations Hub? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it is unique to Operations Hub. So what you would need to do, uh, full transparency, Operations Hub has, um, uh, actually has four tiers, strictly speaking. It has a free tier, which will give you access to data sync. You can connect apps to HubSpot and sync data bidirectionally. Um, it has a starter tier, which effectively is the same thing, but the addition of allowing you to uh, map custom fields between those applications. Then on the pro tier uh, is when the automation and the workflow actions come into play. So operations professional is really what we looked at today. That would give you the ability to trigger webhooks, custom coded automation, data formatting. And then on the enterprise tiers, there's uh, all of that. And you also have, have data sets, which is basically um, a real enhancement to our reporting tool. You can run formulas on, on various data sets and that type of thing and collect data in a, in a kind of a logical fashion and also an integration into Snowflake, which is a, a powerful uh, 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 BI tool. So, so uh, it's not applicable to Sales Pro or any other professional tier. It is a, a standalone product in its own right. All right. Um, the next question was by Maria. How do you know the type of property that should be created in order for the information to travel correctly? Yeah, uh, very good question. So if we take Clearbit as an example, but I appreciate this will, this will vary from system to system, the type of data you're working with. But what I'm typically doing here when I'm looking at data is, uh, you know, it, based on the type of data, I kind of know what types of properties to create. And what I mean by that is the company name or the, you know, the company address, that's that's typically text text data, string data. So that would be stored in a single line text field or um, a multi-line text field, if it's an address or something. But there is other types of data as well that would be beneficial to other data types. So for example, uh, you can see here tags even. Um, it might make more sense for tags to be a dropdown. Uh, so that would be a, a, a dropdown field in HubSpot. Uh, now you could have a single line text field for tags if you wanted to. Um, but drop downs would be a bit more easy to use and would you know be easier from a segmentation and automation perspective. And then it gets into the numeric data as well. So you know revenue, number of employees, um, uh, kind of uh, looking through here, I think Alexa, Alexa rankings, that type of thing. Typically, numeric data should be stored in a number field. It could be currency, it could be unformatted or formatted uh, numbers. Uh, and dates then, um, in this case, when the data was indexed isn't probably relevant, but uh, if this was contractual information or something like that, it might make sense to store that within a date property in HubSpot because uh, ultimately you want to segment off of when renewal dates are due and that type of thing. So uh, there is a, a set formula, admittedly, but it, it's really just looking at the type of data you're working with and then I suppose making somewhat of an assumption. All right. Thank you. Um, the next question is by Callie, and I see that actually Max Cohen already, uh, I think, gave an excellent uh, answer to this. Um, but Callie asked, is there a benefit to a dev account over a sandbox? It's a uh, another very valid question. Um, I would say not necessarily. Now, the two aren't necessarily linked together, so it's, it's unfair to compare them. Um, Sandboxes are a feature we've supplied to our enterprise tiers, which is, for all intents and purposes, very similar to a dev account. But what you basically have is a, a replica of, your, of your, your main account. So all of that data is replicated. Uh, you'll notice with the, the test accounts, I had no data. I just had, I think there was two test contacts and there was no companies. It was really just a, a clean canvas for me to work within. Um, now, to be quite honest with you, the trade-offs trade come in from, from a, I suppose, from a dev's perspective. Um, test accounts, in my opinion, are, 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 are much more useful um, purely because I may be exploring using a tool, and I do this quite often with other third parties, and I don't want to set up a, a paid account or a, a free trial. I'd rather just create a developer account and you know, play with the functionality to my heart's content and try and do things and break things, et cetera. And, and that's really the, the value of a test account. There's really no... Um, uh, you know, there's, there's no obligation for you to 
you know, move forward with HubSpot to put it quite bluntly, it, it's your chance to become familiar with the tools from a technical perspective and make sure you're happy. Um, but in a perfect world, you'd be on an enterprise tier and you would be using a sandbox environment, which would allow you to do the same thing. The only difference really would be that you're, you're actually using existing data in the CRM as opposed to any dummy data that you might generate. Right. Just a, a message to all of the, all of you attending. Um, please upvote on any questions you'd like to see answered first, because we're running short on time and there's uh, a lot <laughs> of questions in here. Um, but any questions that we don't get to, we'll uh, of course answer in the community. I will uh, put the link to the community in the chat in, uh, in just a moment. Um, but thanks for answering that. Our next question is by uh, Andreas. Is there a tutorial that shows how to do this with OAuth since um, Marketplace does require that? And I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly, but... Uh... You, you, you did. So um, currently with our custom coded actions, it does not support OAuth. Um, it, 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 it only supports using API keys um, for authentication at present. Uh, it's, it's true that if your app is on the Marketplace or if you're using a Market-based application, you'd go through an OAuth flow where you'd, you know, you'd log in as a user, connect the app, it generates the, the, the code, the access token, and moving forward, the app is talking to your portal. Custom coded automation right now is, is uh, specifically uh, only supporting API keys. Uh, I believe there are plans to eventually incorporate OAuth, and I, I'm almost certain that there are ways around that, though I haven't really experimented with that myself. Um, there are ways to kind of, um, you know, uh, modify that flow, but, but, but API key is, is really the only thing that a custom coded action will support at present. Next question is by Vicky. What is the benefit of using the custom code actions rather than the native Clearbit HubSpot integration? So I knew that question would come up and it's a very valid question. Um, I would encourage you to use the native Clearbit HubSpot integration. Um, they have a lot of exciting updates as well. I was lucky enough to see coming to fruition um, this quarter. Uh, so I'd highly recommend you continue using it. Um, admittedly, the reason I chose Clearbit is a few reasons. Number one, uh, I was just looking for a, a, you know, a solid platform that people in the industry know and love uh, that would give me a good way to try and test this functionality and demonstrate a use case. Uh, the other, I, I suppose, reason you might choose to use custom coded automation with Clearbit may be because you might have more advanced logic that the integration doesn't facilitate. And that's the same for any integration for that matter. Um, you know, building things from scratch naturally does give you more flexibility and freedom to do the things you want. That does come at a cost, admittedly, in time and resources, and sometimes money, not to mention maintenance. Um, but it's true, the Clearbit integration that's up on the ecosystem, highly recommend uh, installing. You might be using it already. Um, I suppose today was really just about learning about the mechanisms. Uh, Clearbit, I wanted to pull in because I think as well, uh, as I mentioned several times, they're, they're a great solution, very powerful tool. Um, and I just personally have enjoyed working with them uh, in the past. All right, the next question is by Jewel. Do I have to learn JavaScript in order to do this or is there a dummy version for non-coders? Yeah, uh, so you do need to have some level of proficiency in JavaScript. Now, uh, what I would say, uh, pull, it, pull up a few things. Um, uh, programmable use case. Uh, let me just pull up something. Uh, I appreciate that not everyone on the call, I'm not, I, like, I'm not a software engineer by trade. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of you out there in a similar situation to myself. And, you know, in reality, it, it, people struggle to write code from scratch. That's, that's, I completely understand. What we've done to try and make that a little bit easier is we've collected some common use cases and continues to grow, where you can come in here and actually copy the code in and there's instructions to get this running. Um, again, okay, it still does require a basic understanding of JavaScript, but to be quite honest with you, you know, nothing that a quick Google wouldn't solve if you're, you know, trying to cook corners. Um, so there isn't a dummy version, I hate to say that, but uh, there is a lot of resources to help you upskill and actually get the, get the most out of this. Next question is by Stacy. Does this work both ways? So in the same workflow, could you then send data back to Clearbit to update their end, or is this only pulling data into HubSpot? No, so you absolutely could do that. And in fact, the, the workshop we'll be doing the final week of, of, of um, February, we'll be doing just that. So that custom code I built, uh, 
the action I built is pulling data out. But equally, and I'm not sure if Clearbit has these endpoints, but if they had an endpoint to update information, I could certainly make a request and send data out. And that's something I've seen customers do. Uh, an example most recently was uh, a lot of companies might offer SaaS companies free trials. So you could have a, you know, a HubSpot form that somebody maybe fills out a, uh, to request access to a free trial and a custom coded workflow in the background that actually checks to see if they've had a free trial previously. And if not, set them up with one and provision one. So data does not only have to come in, one of the really great joys about it is data can also go out. Okay, uh, another question by Jewel. Uh, do I have to learn? Oh, I think I've already answered this one. Yeah. Uh, I apologize. It, uh, no, no, it's okay. Gone down. Um, one question by OFG Advertising. We made an integration between HubSpot and CreditSafe for EMEA. We could have used Clearbit. Uh, with what advantages? Um, okay, if I understand, I, I, I guess they're saying, what would be the benefit of using Clearbit in their, they've, they built out their own solution and they wanted to integrate that with Clearbit. Is that, is that kind yeah, of what that is what, uh, that's my understanding as well. Uh, yeah, so um, now Clearbit ultimately would be the best people to speak to this, but the advantage to using Clearbit, at least from my, um, they, they took the time to walk me through their solution in a lot of detail prior to this workshop as well is um, Clearbit, one of the joys of Clearbit is when you connect your CRM to Clearbit or your, your, your whatever app to Clearbit for that matter, uh, that data, can then be used for retargeting at scale. Now, you might have, let's say, a thousand records to work with, but Clearbit in reality has much, much more than that across their entire platform. So one of the real interesting things about Clearbit and the very powerful things about Clearbit is it also employs its, its, its own data, the data that it has within its systems to basically amplify your reach. Um, it also does some really cool things around um, uh, conversion points with, with form fields. Um, so for example, uh, you know, naturally the, the shorter reform, the better. Uh, it, it, it obviously assists in conversion. Um, you don't wanna be asking questions that maybe you already know the answers to. So what Clearbit can actually do too is it can identify fields on a form that you're operating and it will actually hide those fields dynamically. So that for instance, for instance, if I come to a form, well, it knows that my IP is tied to HubSpot, for example. So let's not bother asking Jack for the company he works for um, or the industry he works in. And it gives me less, um, less of a need than to actually uh, uh, to, to, to supply that information. I'm more likely to convert. So Clearbit does a huge amount, um, not just this data enrichment piece, um, but uh, yeah, hopefully that addresses it. Right, and I think this will be our last question because we're coming up at the top of the hour. Uh, it's by Kevin. Please advise on data security. Um, different domains are involved. Uh, I'm not sure, but maybe you could talk about you know, the data security behind the, the integration. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what, I suppose first and foremost, HubSpot is uh, SOC 2 type 2 compliant. Um, that is not an easy certification to achieve. Uh, so as a company, security is incredibly, incredibly important to us. And I don't think we'd be as successful as we are if that wasn't the case. Um, our SOC 2 reports will give more insights into those security measures. But in essence, all of the data that's, that, 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 that's passed with HubSpot is encrypted, for starters. Uh, you'll also see with custom coded automation, we have the ability to use secrets. So you're not exposing any sensitive uh, API keys or user tokens. Um, now, it's true. I can't speak for the systems you might be communicating out to. Uh, you know, For example, if I built my own app, I could make a request from a HubSpot workflow to that app. And the, the onus is on me to ensure the security and integrity of that application. Um, that is something we don't have visibility over. Uh, so there is obviously that exercise, that, that level of caution that has to be taken. Um, but from, from HubSpot standpoint, the, the, the data is secure and encrypted. Um, and we do a whole lot more internally to make sure that our systems operate to a, in a compliant and, 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 and high standard within the industry. And I guess um, that's our uh, last question. <laughs> uh, that's it. So I, I guess, look, I, I know people are probably jumping off for a minute over. Thank you so much for your time. As Jan mentioned, we'll follow up with these questions that we didn't get to on the community. We'll share the slides. We'll share the recording. Um, for anyone that didn't maybe build this out, hopefully that will help you to, to achieve that. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect and, and, and talk more there. And feel free to sign up for the other sessions uh, that will be happening each week this month. And it was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to me. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Cheers.